our studios in the heart of Silicon Valley, Palo Alto, California. This is a CUBE Conversation. Hello everyone, welcome to this CUBE conversation here in Palo Alto, California. At the CUBE studios, I'm John Furrier, host of the CUBE. We're here for a company profile, a company called Diamante. We're here with Tom Barton, the CEO. As VMworld approaches, a lot of stuff is going to be talked about. Kubernetes, applications, microservices will be the top conversation, certainly in the underlying infrastructure to power that. Tom Barton is the CEO of Diamante, which is in that business. Tom, we've known each other for a few years. You've done a lot of great successful ventures. Um, Diamante's new one you've got on your plate here right now. Yes, sir, and I'm happy to be here. So I've been with Diamante just for about a year or so. Um, I found out about the company through a headhunter, um, and I have to admit I had not heard of the company before, um, but I was a huge believer in containers and Kubernetes. Um, so I was already sold on that, and so I had a friend of mine his name is Brian Walden. He had done some massive Kubernetes cloud-based deployments for us at Planet Labs, a, a company that I was at for a little over three years. So I had him do technical due diligence. Brian was also the number three guy at CoreOS, um, and so deeply steeped in all of the core technologies around Kubernetes, including things like etcd and, and other elements of the technology. So he looked at it, um, came back and gave me two thumbs up. Um, he liked it so much that I then hired him. So he is now our VP of product management. Um, and the, the cool thing about Diamante is essentially we're a purpose-built solution for running container-based workloads in Kubernetes on premises and then hooking that in with the cloud. Um, so we believe it's very much going to be a hybrid cloud world where for the major corporations that we serve, Fortune 500 companies like banks, um, like energy and utilities and so forth, a lot of their workload will maintain and, and be maintained on, on premises. They still want to be cloud compatible, so they need a purpose-built platform to sort of manage both environments. Yeah, we certainly, uh, those, you guys have come up on our radar, but I was really curious to see uh, when you came in and took over at the helm of the CEO because your entrepreneurial career really has been unique. You're a unique executive, both entrepreneurial and as an, as an operator. You have an open source and software background and also uh, you had a com very successful um, companies and exits there, as well as on the hardware side with Rackable, you took that company, went public. So you got, I mean, it's unique, and then open source, right? You got software, open source, and large hardware, large data center deployments right. at scale, which is essentially the hybrid cloud market right now. So you kind of got the unique perspective. You have seen the view from all the different sides. Yeah. And I think now more than ever with public cloud certainly being validated, everyone knows Amazon, if you're greenfield, right. you start in the cloud but the reality is hybrid cloud is the operating model of the gen this next generation of companies, probably for the next 20 to 30 years. And this is the, the biggest conversation, the most important story in tech. You're in the middle of it with a hot startup, with a name that probably no one's ever heard of. Right, right, we hope to change that, obviously. Why, why did you join this company? What got your attention? What was the, the key thing? Once you dug in there, what was the secret sauce? What, was, what got your attention? Yeah, so to me again, the, the market environment, I'm a huge believer that if you look at the history of the last 15 years, we went from an environment that was 0% virtualized to 95% virtualized with you know, VM-based technologies from VMware and others. I think that fundamentally containers and Kubernetes are equally as important and are going to be equally as transformative going forward in how people manage their workloads both on-premises and in the clouds, right? And the fact that all three public cloud providers have anointed Kubernetes as the way of the future and the Docker image format and runtime as the wave of the future means, you know, good things are going to happen there. What I thought was unique about the company was for the first time, you know, surprisingly none of the x86 vendors um, and in companies like Nutanix that have hyper-converged solutions, they really didn't have anything that was purpose-built for native container support. And so the founders all came from Cisco UCS. They had a lot of familiarity with the underpinnings of hyper-converged architectures in the x86 server landscape and networking subsystems and storage subsystems, but they wanted to build it using the latest technologies, things like NVMe-based Flash, um, and they wanted to do it with a software stack that was native containers in, in Kubernetes. And today we support two flavors of that one that's fully open source um, around upstream Kubernetes and another that supports our partner Red Hat with OpenShift. I think you're really onto something pretty big here because one of the things that Dave Vellante and I and Stu Miniman and our team have been looking at is, we're calling it Cloud 2.0 for the lack of a better word, kind of riff on the web 2.0 concept. But you know, Cloud 1.0 was Amazon. Okay, right. DevOps, Agile, Great, check the box, we move on with life. It's always, it's a great resource, it's never going to stop. 
But cloud 2.0 is about networking, it's about security, it's about data, and if you look at all the innovation startups, mm -hmm. they all have one characteristic. They're all playing in this um, hyper-converged hardware meets software stack right. um, with data and agility kind of to make the original DevOps model go better, the 1.0, which was storage and compute, yeah. which where virtualization played. Yeah. So, so you're seeing that pattern and it's, it's wide ranging. It's security, it's data, everything else. So, so that's kind of what we call the cloud 2.0 game. So if you look at VMworld, if you look at what's going on, the conversations around microservices, right. it's an application centric conversation right. in an infrastructure show. So do you see that same vision? And if so, how do you guys see you enabling the, the customer out there saying, hey, you know what, I have all this legacy, mm -hmm. I got full scale data centers, I need to go full scale cloud, and I need zero disruption to my developer community. Yeah, so this is the beauty of containers and Kubernetes, which is they know it'll run on the premises, they know it will run in, in the cloud, right? Um, and it's, it is all about microservices, so whether they're trying to adopt the modern database, something like MongoDB, or MariaDB or Crunchy Postgres, um, whether it's on the operational side to enable sort of more frequent and incremental change or whether it's on the developer side to take advantage of new ways of developing and delivering apps with CI CD tools and so forth. It's pretty much what people want to do because it's future proofing your software development effort, right? So there's sort of two streams of demand. One is refactoring legacy applications that are insufficiently kind of um, you know, granularized and, and behave and fail in a monolithic way, um, as well as trying to adopt modern, modern cloud-based native you know solutions for things like databases, right? And so the the good news is that customers don't have to refactor everything. There are logical breakpoints in their application stack where they can say okay, maybe I don't have the time and energy and, and resources to totally refactor a legacy consumer banking application, but at least I can refactor the database tier and serve up you know, container and Kubernetes-based services as microservices, database as a service to be consumed by So they the don't need to kill the old to bring in the new. Right, it's they very They can use containers and, or, and orchestration layer like Kubernetes and still be positioned for whether it's service meshes or other things coming down Absolutely. for that piece of the infrastructure and everything else could run as is. Right, and there are multiple de deployment scenarios for containers. You can run containers bare metal. Most of our customers choose to do that. Um, you can also run containers on top of virtual machines and you can actually run virtual machines on top of containers. So um, one of our major media customers actually runs Splunk on top of KVM on top of containers. Um, so there's a lot of different deployment scenarios and really a lot of the genius of our architecture was to make it easy for people that are coming from traditional virtualized environments to kind of remap system resources from a VM to, to a container at a native level or through a, a VM. You mentioned uh, the, the history lesson there around virtualization, how you know, 15 years ago there was no virtualization, now virtually everything's, everything's virtualized. Mm -hmm. We agree with you that containers and Kubernetes is going to change that game for the next 15 years. But what's interesting about VMware, what made them successful was they could add virtualization without requiring <laughs> code modification. Right. And, and they did it kind of under the covers. Um, how, and that's a concern customers have. I have developers out there, they're, they're building stacks, they're building code, I got pre-existing legacy. They don't really want to change their code. Right. Do you guys fit into that narrative? We, we do, right? So every customer makes their own choice about something like that at the end of the day. Um, I mentioned Splunk. So at, at the time that we supported this media customer on Splunk, Splunk had not yet provided a container-based version for their application. Now they do have that, but at the time they supported KVM but not native containers. And so unmodified Splunk, unmodified application, we took them from a batch job that, that ran for 23 hours down to one hour based on accelerating and on our hyper-converged appliance and running unmodified code on unmodified KVM on, on our gear, right? So some customers, will choose to do that. Um, but there are also other customers, particularly at scale for transactionally intensive applications like databases and messaging and, and analytics where they say, you know, we could, we could preserve our legacy virtualized infrastructure, but let's try it as a bare metal container approach. And they, they discover that there's actually some savings from both a business standpoint yeah. and a technology tax standpoint or an overhead standpoint. And so, um, as I mentioned, most of our customers actually So there's real efficiencies there, it's in the patch yeah. is a great example. Yeah. All right, so let's dig into the product and technology differentiated. What's the big secret sauce? Describe the product. Why are you winning in accounts? What's the lift in your business right now? You guys are getting some traction from what I'm hearing. Yeah, sure, so like at the, at the highest level, the value proposition is simplicity. There is no other purpose-built, you know, complete hardware software stack that delivers Kubernetes 
you know, production Kubernetes environment up and running in 15 minutes, right? The x86 server guys don't really have it. Um, Nutanix doesn't really have it. The software companies that are active in the space don't really have it. Um, so everything that you need, the, the hardware platform, the storage infrastructure, the actual distribution of the operating system, CentOS, for example, we distribute. We actually distribute a Kubernetes dis distribution upstream and unmodified. And then very importantly, in the, in the Kubernetes landscape, you have to have a storage subsystem and a, and a networking subsystem using something called CSI, Container Storage Interface, and CNI, Container ne you know, Networking Interface. So we've got that full stack solution. No one else has that. Um, second thing is the performance. So we do a certain amount of hardware offload. Um, and I would cite Amazon's purchase of Annapurna. So Amazon mm -hmm. bought a company called Annapurna. It's the basis of their nitro technology. And it's, it's little known, but the reality is more than 50% of all new instances at EC2 are hardware assisted with the, the technology that they bought. So that's so, what you mean by hardware offloaded? Yeah, exactly. So we actually offload storage and network processing via two PCIe cards that can go into any industry server, right? So today we ship on an Intel white so box. So you're hyper-converged containers. We're, we're hyper-converged containers. <laughs> yeah, sort of, exactly. Yeah. So you're selling a box. We sell a box. With software, that's the... With advantage. software, but increasingly our customers are asking us to unbundle it. So not dissimilar from the, the sort of journey that Nutanix went through. Um, if a customer wants to buy on Dell, we'll support Dell. If a customer wants to buy on Lenovo, we'll support Lenovo and we'll just sell so them. So the have software. you unbundled yet or you're unbundling? We are actively taking orders for unbundling at the present time. And this quarter we have validated Dell and Lenovo as alternate platforms to the Intel. And uh, you have subscription box. revenue on that? We do not yet, but that's the goal of this quarter, right? <laughs> that's Nutanix so, struggled with. So, yeah. and, and they had to take their medicine. They did, but they, you know, they had to do that as a public company. Yeah. We're still a private company, <laughs> yeah. so we can do that outside the limelight of the public markets. So, um, I'm expecting that you guys are going to get pretty much, um, I won't say picked off, but certainly I think your doors are going to be knocked on by uh, the big guys, certainly Dell, at Dell EMC, for instance, I think is very, you said you're doing business with Dell and EMC? Um, we are doing as a channel partner and as an OEM partner with them at the present time. They're, I wouldn't call them a customer. How do you look at VMware, obviously they're in the VMware business and Pat Gelsinger's on the record. Yes. He'll be on theCUBE. He said, you know, Kubernetes is the dial tone of the internet. Mm -hmm. They're investing, they're doubling down on it. They bought Heptio for half a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. They're big on cloud native. We expect to see at VMworld tons of cloud native conversations. Yes. Good, bad for you? What's the ta I think tailwind? It's good. It legitimizes what we're doing, right? And, and so obviously VMware is a large and successful company. Um, that kind of you know, legacy and presence in the data center isn't going to go anywhere overnight. There's a huge set of tooling and infrastructure that VMware has developed and offers to their customers. Um, but that said, I think they've recognized and their acquisition of Heptio is, is indicative of the fact that they know that the world's moving this way. I think that at the end of the day, it's going to be up to the customer, right? The mm -hmm. customer is going to say, do I want to run containers inside a VM? Do I want to run them bare metal? Um, but importantly, I think because of you know, the impact of the cloud providers in, in particular, um, if you think of the lingua franca of, of cloud native, it's going to be around Docker image format, it's going to be around Kubernetes, it's not necessarily going to be around um, VMDK and VMX and ESX, yeah. right? So these are all very good technologies, but I think increasingly, you know, the open standard and open yeah. source community I mean, we see people putting this. Kubernetes on switches directly, there's no, mm. no need right. to have anything else there. So I got to ask you on the customer equation, you mentioned you, you got some, you're taking orders. How are you guys doing business today? Where are you guys winning? Give an example of, of why, why you're winning. And then for anyone watching, how would they know if the, they should be a customer of yours? What's, is there like, a, is there any smoke signs and signals inside the enterprise? They, you mentioned batch to one hour. I mean, that's just music. There's a lot yeah. of financial services years, for instance. You know, they have timetables on yeah. whether they're pulling backups back or doing all the kinds of things, timing's critical. Mm -hmm. What's the profile customer? Why would someone call you? What's the situation? The profile is heavy duty production requirements to run in both the developer context and an operating context, container and Kubernetes based workloads on premises that are compatible with the cloud, right? So increasingly our control plane makes it easy to manage workloads, not just on premises, but also back and forth to the public cloud. So I would argue that essentially all Fortune 500 companies, Global 1000 companies are all wrestling with what's the right way to implement industry standard x86 based hardware on site um, that supports containers and Kubernetes and is cloud compatible, right? So that, that is the number one question that So I can buy a box and or yes. software, put it on my data center, yes. and then have that operate with Amazon, Absolutely. Azure, or Google. Which is the beauty of the Kubernetes standards, right? As long as you are Kubernetes certified, which we are, 
Um, you can develop and run any workload on our gear, on the cloud, on anyone else that's Kubernetes certified, et cetera. So you know that there's no- Give an example of a workload that would be indicative of the so, value um, proposition. Well, I'll, I'll cite one customer, right? So um, and the reason that I feel confident actually saying the name is that they actually sort of went public with us at the recent Gartner conference a week or so ago, and the customer is Duke Energy. So very typical trajectory of, of journey for a customer like this, which is a couple years ago, they decided that they wanted to refactor some legacy applications to make them more resilient to things like hurricanes and weather events and spikes in demand that are associated with that. And so they said, what's the right thing to do? And immediately they picked containers and Kubernetes. And then they went out and they looked at five different vendors. And we were the only vendor that got their POC up and running in the required time frame and hit all five use case scenarios that they wanted to do, right? So they ended up refactoring core applications for how they manage power outages using containers and Kubernetes. So a real production workflow. Real production. That we they had to in, develop yes. and stand up. Absolutely. In a sandbox. Yep. Push it into production and yep. be working. Absolutely. So you sounds like you guys are positioned to handle any workload. We can handle any workload, but I would say that uh, where we shine is things that are transactionally intensive. Because we have the hardware assist and the IO offload for the storage and the networking, you know, the, the most demanding um, applications, things like databases, things like analytics, things like messaging, Kafka, and so forth are, are where we're really going to so show. So large flow of data. Yeah, absolutely. Transactional data. Yeah, we have customers that are doing simpler things like CI, CD, which at the en end of the day involves compiling things, right, and, and managing code bases, but, um, so we certainly have customers in less performance intensive applications, but where nobody can really touch us, and what I, what I mean is literally sort of 10 to 30 times faster than something that Nutanix could do, for example, is, you, is so in So you're those, saying you're 30 times faster than Nutanix? Absolutely, in transactionally intensive applications. Does, and when you sell a subscription, not to dig into the business model a little bit, but does the customer get the hardware assist on that as well? It, to date, we've always bundled everything together, so the customers have automatically gotten the hardware on the, assist. On the, on the hardware um, box. Yes. But if I buy the software, I got to load it on a machine. That's right. But does yes. that machine give me the hardware? It system? will not unless you have our two PCIe cards, right? And so this is how, you know, we're just in the very early, early stages of negotiating with companies like Dell to make it easy for them to integrate our two PCIe cards into their server platform. So the preferred yeah. flagship is the, is the device. The, it's if the they, device. If they, if they yeah. want the hardware assist, if they still need the software, it's maybe right. not that intensive. That's right. If they don't need to have 30 times faster than Nutanix, they can just get the software. Right, right. And that'll yeah. involve our CSI plugin, our CNI plugin, our OS distribution, our Kubernetes distribution, and the control plane that manages Kubernetes clusters. Tom, it's been great to get the um, feature on the new company. Um, give a quick plug for the company. What's your objectives? What are you trying to do? Obviously, you're probably hiring, got some financing, any news, any kind of yeah, things you want we, to share? Yeah, we, we will be announcing some news about financing. I'm not prepared to announce that today, but we're in very good shape with respect to being funded for our growth. Um, and consequently, so we're, we're now in growth mode. So today we're 55 people. Um, I want to double that over the course of the next four quarters um, and increasingly just sort of build out our sales force, right? We didn't have a big enough sales force in North America. We've got to establish a beachhead in EMEA. We do have one large commercial banking customer in Europe right now. Um, we also have a large automotive manufacturer in APAC, but um, you know the total sales and marketing reach has been too low, and so a, a huge focus of what I'm doing now is building out our go-to-market model and um, sort of 10xing the amount. So of standing up a lot of field, going to, going to market. Yeah. How about on the biz dev side? I'm going to imagine that you mentioned Dell. I can imagine that there's a, a large appetite for uh, the hardware offload. Absolutely. Option. Yeah, absolutely. So is that something that biz dev um, boils down to striking partnerships with the cloud providers really on two fronts, both with respect to hardware offload and assist, but also supporting their on-premises strategies. So Google, for example, has announced Anthos. Mm -hmm. This is their approach to supporting you know, on-premises uh, Kubernetes workloads and how they interact with Google Cloud, right? Um, as you can imagine, Microsoft and Amazon also have on-premises um, aspirations and strategies and we want to support those as well. This goes well beyond something like Amazon Outpost, which is really a narrow, use case and point solution for certain markets. Um, so cloud provider partnerships are very important. X86 server vendor partnerships are very important and then major ISV. So we've announced some things with Red Hat. We were at the Red Hat um, Open Summit um, in Boston a few months ago and announced our OpenShift project and, and product um, that is now GA. Um, also working with ISVs like MariaDB, MongoDB, Splunk and others too. So solid tech team, yeah. product team. Right. You guys are solid, you We're feel good. good on the product. I feel very technology. good about the product. What about the skeptics that are out there, just to put the hard question to you, is man, it's crowded field. How are you going to compete? 
What are your chances? How do you like your chances knowing that's a very crowded field? You're gonna it's you're gonna unique. rely on your fastball, as they say, and on the speed. What's the what's the what's your thinking on? Well, it's unique, and so part part of the way or, or a proof point that I would cite there is is the channel, right? So when you go to the channel, and channel is afraid that you're gonna piss off Dell or EMC or NetApp or Nutanix or somebody, you know, then they're not gonna promote you. But our channel partners are promoting us. I'm talking about companies like Lifeboat at the distribution level. I'm talking about companies like CDW, SHI. Um, you know, WWT, these, these major North American distributors and, and resellers have basically said, look, we have to put you in our line car because you're unique. There is no other purpose built. And why they like that? They know. get more services around that? They wrap services around it? They want to sell the deals. hardware, they want to wrap services around it, absolutely. And they want to do migrations from legacy environments towards yeah. microservices, et, et cetera. Great to have you on, share the company update. Just want to get personal, uh, if you don't mind, personal perspective. You know, you've been on the hardware side, you've seen the large scale data centers from Rackable and that experience. You've also been on the hard, uh, software side, open source. What's your take on the industry right now? Because you're seeing, um, I talked to a lot of CISOs around the security space and you know, they all say, oh, multi-cloud's a bunch of BS because I'm not going to split my development team between four clouds. I need to have my people building software stacks mm -hmm for my APIs, and then I go to the vendors and say, support my APIs or you can't be a supplier. Now that's on the CISO side, but the, the big <coughs> mega trend is, there's software stacks being built inside the premise of the yes, enterprises. Yes. That not, I mean, they had developers before building, you know, COBOL apps in the old days, mainframes to client server apps, but now you're seeing a renaissance of developers building a stack mm -hmm. for the domain specific applications that they need. I think and that requires that they have to run on an on-premise, hyperscale-like environment. What's your take on this? My, my take is it's absolutely right. There is more software-based innovation going on, so customers are deciding to write their own software in areas where they can differentiate, right? They're not going to do it in areas that they can get commodity solutions from a SaaS standpoint or, or from other kinds of on-prem standpoint, but increasingly they are doing software development, but they are all 99% of the time now, they are choosing Docker and containers and Kubernetes as the way in which they're going to do that because it will run either on-prem or in the cloud. Um, I do think that multi-cloud management or multi-you know multi-cloud is not a reality. Um, our our primary modality that we see our customers choose is tons of on-premises resources that's going to continue for the foreseeable future. Then they pick one preferred cloud provider because it's simply too difficult to to do more than one. But at the same time, they want a, an environment that will not allow themselves to be locked into that cloud vendor, right? So they want to potentially experiment with a with a second public cloud provider or just make sure that they adhere to standards like Kubernetes that are universally shared so that they can't be held hostage. But in practice, people don't Or if they do have multi-cloud, it might be applications just like if you're running Office 365. Right. That's right. Microsoft. It, it could be, yes, exactly, on one particular So domain-specific cloud, but not a right. core cloud. Right. Have a backup, use Kubernetes as the bridge. Right. That do you see that? Do you see that? I mean, I would agree with. By the way, we we agree with you on that. But the question that we always ask is, we think Kubernetes is going to be that interoperability layer, the way TCP/IP was within IP networks, where you had you know this, this interoperability model. We think that there there will be a future state at yes. some point yes. where I could connect to Google and use Microsoft and use Amazon. That's right. Together, but not. That's today. right. And 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 so nobody's really doing that today. But yeah, no. um, I believe and we believe that there is a a, a future world where a, a vendor neutral um, vendor neutral with respect to public cloud providers can can offer a hybrid cloud control plane that manages and brokers workloads for both production as well as data protection and disaster recovery across any arbitrary cloud vendor that you want to use. Um, and so it's got to be an independent third party. Yeah. So you know, you're never going to trust Amazon to broker a workload to Google. You're never going to trust Google to broker a workload to Microsoft. Um, so it's not going to be one of the big three. And if you look at who could it be, it could be VMware, uh, Pivotal, now Cisco's got an interesting opportunity. Same. Cisco's got an interesting opportunity, Red Hat's got an interesting opportunity, but there is actually, you know, it's less than, the number of companies can be counted on one hand that have the technical capability to develop a, a hybrid cloud abstraction that, that spans both on-premises and all three. And, and, and it's super early, if you had to peg yeah. the inning on this one. First inning, obviously. First inning. Yeah, it's yeah. really early. Yeah, we like our odds though, because the disruption, the fundamental disruption here is containers and Kubernetes and the interest that um, they're generating and, and the desire on the part of customers to go to microservices. So a ton of application refactoring and a ton of cloud native application development is going on. And so, you know, with that kind of disruption, you can so build you're a company. So you're targeting application refactoring that needs to run on a cloud operating model, yes. on-premise and public. That's correct. 
in a sense, Diamante really brings the cloud to the on-premises environment, right? So, for example, we are the only company that has the concept of on-premises availability zones. We have synchronous replication where you can have multiple clusters that are synchronously replicated. So if one fails, the other one, you have no service disruption or loss of data, even for a state full application, right? So it's cloud-like services that we're bringing on-prem and then providing the links you know, for both DR and DP and production workloads to the public cloud. A lot, lot to unpack with you guys at DMI. We're going to keep track of it. You mentioned stateful data. It's a whole other topic um, mm -hmm. as, you know, stateless data is easy to manage with APIs and services. When it gets state, that's when it gets interesting. Right, right. <laughs> well, Tom one, Barton, one the CEO, the uh, new chief executive officer at Diamante. Uh, how long have you guys been around before you took over? Couple, about five years, uh, four years before me. About, about a, I've been on board about a year. Great show, looking forward to tracking your progress. We'll see you next week okay. uh, in San Francisco at VMworld. Tom Barton, CEO of Diamante here inside theCUBE, hot startup. I'm John Furrier, thanks for watching.